are the last speakers before the uh, yeah before the coffee break. So I hope we can get you interested in uh, Philips MRI for uh, where we use uh, process mining for operational profile for system verification. And just uh, as a quick introduction, uh, I'm Mark Pijnenberg. I work for Philips Healthcare uh, for MRI. Uh, in the system verification, uh, system integration and verification department, and Carmen Bradson, she will uh, also uh, um, have part of the talk, and she works for AC, and um, I will talking about more about uh, more about why we are doing operational profiles, and Carmen will talk more about uh, how we are going to do it, and mainly also about the, the process mining part. Um, so just to give you a little bit of an, uh, yeah, heads up for what we're really doing and why we're really doing it, um, I brought a small video with me um, yeah, explaining what an MRI actually is, and I will try to talk you through it. Um, yeah, because I hope most of you don't, didn't get an MRI before, because that means, of course, that you, uh, yeah, that, that you needed the diagnosis. Um, so let me show you the video a little bit. And there should have been sound, but I don't hear it <laughs> anyway. Um, so what you see over here, at first an operator is positioning a patient um, on, the, on the table. And uh, what you see next is that the patient will get um, uh, a bell for an emergent when there is... If you would use this one. So that the operator can still hear the patient. And of course they need um, hearing devices. or. Um, uh, hearing protection because an MRI well does make a quite a lot of sound I can tell you and although we're trying to keep that down as much as possible yeah we can't prevent that it still makes sound what you saw happening is that the operator put um, yeah uh, something in front on top of the on top of the uh, uh, face of the patient and that's actually a receive coil and where the signal the from the uh, from scan yeah basically um, is uh, captured now you see that the door is closed from the examination room and immediately one of the scans is, uh, is actually starting. And now you already see that some of the images are already appearing. Um, and this is actually one of the main topics that we were going to discuss as well. Uh, you saw that multiple of those scans have been running and that there is now one of the images uh, in there and that's a brain image because well, we saw that, that receive coil that we had was actually positioned on the head and um, yeah fortunately enough we also get an image of a brain so that's a little bit setting the context um, and we will get to that a little bit we will get into more context a little bit uh, during the rest of the presentation um, but first uh, there are several steps that you can take when performing an MRI scan. So one of them, one of the first one, is actually patient preparation. So what you just saw, um, yeah, that's one of the steps but in the video. But beforehand, you know, the patient still needs to be prepared. So there is a questionnaire that the patient has to answer because the uh, patient can have metal implants, for example, which can be a safety uh, which can be a safety issue uh, because not all, yeah, not all patients with metal implants can be scanned. Especially, for example, with patients with a pacemaker, yeah, there, there has to be, uh, usually that's only on low field strengths, and al also that the pacemaker sometimes has to be turned off. Uh, and in a, in a lot of cases, they can't even go into the MRI scanner at all. Uh, other things that uh, need to be done, for example, is that an infusion needle can be, uh, can be required, so uh, infusion uh, needs to be... Um, yeah, it has to be uh, uh, put in. Um, and But next thing is that the patient really needs to be positioned. And that's actually what we saw happening in the video. You saw that the patient was put on the t placed on the table. You saw that the receive coil was placed on the, on the head. And you also saw that the patient was actually moved into the, uh, into the scanner. So far, so good, you would say. Um, but then the next thing is, the next thing is, yes, <laughs> uh, is that you have to perform an examination. And that is what you saw also happening in the video, is that um, first, you see, uh, first scan is being performed, 
then uh, the then the next and then uh, that is actually basically a scan where you can plan on your next scans and then you can yeah can actually do scans that have a higher resolution higher that are of better quality than your first scan and that's that's a really multiple scan so and it can be of different kinds of contrasts that can have different resolutions so there are quite a lot of variations there and actually the difference is there so select one of the study scans, study protocols, uh, the different scans, uh, different post-processings, different pre-processing steps. That's what we typically would call in Philips terminology called an exam card. And that's uh, one of the things that uh, maybe is good to remember because that's what we will focus on for process planning. Um, finally, um, yeah, we have to prepare the room once more. So first the patient has to be released from the table, from the scanner and we have to prepare the system for the next patient. So this is basically looking at an MR scanner from a patient view. But if you would do it from a system view, we actually, um, yeah, we're actually going to look uh, for multiple patients. So one patient can have a, cer a certain workflow has to be performed, but for a next patient, a certain workflow can actually be quite different. Similar, most of the steps that are performed from, for, the page for, up for a certain patient are the same as for an other patient, but, the different, but there can be quite a lot of differences in the specifics. And that's where we will come into, and that's where we also, uh, yeah, where Karma will do a lot of explanation. So, yeah, what you see actually is you have one patient, and then you have some system activity, and then for your next patient, uh, you do a bunch of uh, different uh, things, and then you have some system activities, and that's basically a repetitive behavior with uh, quite a lot of, but still with uh, quite a lot of differences in there. Um, so let's talk also a little bit about the complexity of uh, MRI, and this is really about complexity based for from maybe like a workflow perspective. Um, and by the way, that's also what we're doing with operational profiles, right? Operational profiles is basically we want to capture uh, what our uh, customers are doing, and um, yeah, we want to we want to use that for uh, verification purposes. So to replay basically what our customers are doing and to get a, in the end get a better uh, test coverage. Um, but let's say, for example. Uh, if you have like a thousand, uh, a thousand MRI uh, scanners, uh, you can imagine that uh, on a daily basis, on every scanner, well, let's say around 10 examinations are performed a day. Um, so ten, basically 10 patients. Um, and for every uh, examination, you would say that around, well, what did, what did we say over here? Like ten, around 10... Um, uh, ten, would contain around 10 different scans. So, adding that up, you have quite a lot of exams, you will, you, for uh, quite a lot of patients a day, you get even more scans a day, um, and um, con considering the fact that you already have, that, that uh, a user can already influence around 200 parameters, you get even more uh, parameters that can be changed or that, uh, that, are, uh, that can be changed uh, for each and every examination. So, all that will make up for really a lot of uh, log uh, logging uh, that we will use um, uh, during. Um, during our preparation phases, and that can be used also in the end that, uh, for process mining. Actually, one of the nice things uh, over here for, to illustrate a little bit more about the complexity is that uh, nothing in MRI is really standardized. So if you have, for example, each and every region uh, will have its own preferences, uh, each country will have its own preferences, uh, each hospital will have its own preferences regarding uh, parameters, and even uh, each uh, each radiologist in a hospital can have its own prefer can have his or her own preferences. So that makes up for quite a lot of differences, and that will yeah that will prove to be quite complex in the end to yeah to make some general to make out some general way of working in there. 
And a really nice example for that is actually uh, if you go, for example, uh, to Turkey, you see that uh, on average, well, uh, 30 to 40 examinations, so 30 to 40 patients a day are, uh, are done, are scanned every day. And for example, here in the Netherlands, yeah, maybe around 8 to 10 is quite a lot already. So that already gives you a little bit of an impression about the, yeah, about the variations already uh, in different regions. Yeah, and you can imagine if you would uh, scale that up even. So just to show you a little bit what, uh, yeah, what the user interface actually looks like, what the operator can, uh, can uh, use uh, on the scanner. Um, and to show you, I've just highlighted uh, one of the tabs which shows you a couple of parameters that can already be changed by the, uh, by the user, by the operator. Uh, and you see that there are, what is it again, eight tabs, I think, eight or nine tabs, and uh, cons consisting of uh, multiple parameters. So you can already uh, yeah, imagine how many parameters really uh, can be changed uh, by, the, by, the, by the users. So these set of parameters, they make up for a certain scan. Um, yeah, just for one scan. And in this case, uh, we selected uh, yeah, a scan of the neck. And uh, this is a, a certain, yeah, because of this, how you, so you set your parameters, you'll get a certain contrast or a certain resolution or, yeah, whatever. Um, but that is just one scan. So the combination of all of these scans would actually make up for an exam card and would actually make up for multiple different uh, images. And in this case, you can see uh, images of the neck again, uh, two, well, in the sagittal plane, as, uh, as it's called, uh, and two in the transversal plane. So all of them are actually images from the neck. One, uh, the first two are in disorientation and the uh, last two are in uh, disorientation, basically. So where can it actually be applied? Uh, if, for, if we want to uh, look for operational profiles, well, in clinical, oper in clinical applications, basically to validate the workflows uh, and uh, against the no domain knowledge, and also to uh, identify exceptional behavior and update the requirements. But also it can be used in development and in marketing. And marketing, you can typically imagine that uh, they would like to know uh, if a certain feature is really being used. But for us, we're going to use it for system verification and especially for test automation of operational profiles. And yeah, all of what I said before was just setting the context. Um, the operational profiles uh, and what are the ch what are learned a little bit on a high level, what are the challenges that we could have there. Um, but uh, yeah, of, um, but yeah, all incoming data needs to be pre-processed before anal analysis can even start, and that's where I will hand over to Carmen because she knows much more about that, and she can talk more. About it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, basically, Mark presented to you why we wanted to do these operational profiles. Uh, first, I will just say a couple of words about myself. Uh, I'm uh, coming from ESI. ESI is a joint innovation center between TNO, that is the Dutch research organization, and multiple uh, companies. Actually, uh, one of the advantages that we have at ESI is actually that our projects are always with a uh, OEM, uh, very specific. So we have projects with uh, ISML, we have projects with Van der Lande uh, that will present later today with Philips and all, basically almost uh, DAF. Uh, think about all the OEMs in the Iowa region, we are making a project or we had made a project with them. So this basically puts us in a nice position to not just think about what Philips needs, but also to look to across industry and similar companies and see what they all need. So that's why for my next two, three slides, you'll see MRI in the brackets, because what I'm going to tell you initially, it's not 
specific for MRI, but in general. So how do you do an operation profile? So we talk about the data, so on, but where do you start? So most of the times you start thinking about the customer. As Mark already mentioned, you have different type of customer. For example, in the uh, hospitals, they can be general hospitals, they can be specialized hospitals, or uh, they can be research hospitals. Uh, you also have the marketing that does their own um, customer segmentation, so maybe you want to focus on certain segments. So this is basically, when you are selecting your data for your operational profile, you have to think about, okay, which customer I looked. Then you look to the user. Um, the user, maybe you want to see if uh, a doctor will behave, will look behave differently, for example, from uh, a nurse. But in our case, actually, we uh, did this a bit more broader, and we thought we interpret user in terms of the purpose of the scan. So basically, do we want to, uh, it is used to do brain scans, or if it's used to do spine scans, and so on. Because there are a lot of differences. So if we uh, will end up combining all the data, we'll basically get something that we cannot actually analyze. Then you go to the next step, it's configuration. So Mark showed there 10,000 systems, uh, MRI system, but actually they come like from four or five uh, types of families, product families. Seven, uh, seven, okay, even more. And you can imagine even in one product family, you have uh, different types of um, of uh, systems, for example, the magnet uh, can be different, and then there are on certain systems you can do certain type of scan, on other systems you can do other types of scan. So again, there is the question, do you actually want to combine in the same profile this uh, picture? And then I go basically on the specific uh, data, so you, think, you have to think about the function, and actually what we did here, we already said, hey, I'm not going to look to all the functionality that the MRI system can do. I'm going to look to the interface between the user and the system, and I'm going to look just to the scanning procedure, because the, the user can do much more with the interface than just setting up scans. And operational part, basically, I'm not going to just uh, think about uh, uh, what's happening in terms of how many scans are done and so on. I actually want to see the sequence. I want to see exactly which type of combination of these scans happen. So basically, I, we are focusing on this piece, uh, small part. Then, but, okay, so this is more or less the data. Another thing that in industry we need to understand is that when people talk about data science, they look to Google, they look to Facebook, and so on, so on. And there we have these very nice pictures on the internet with so much data that is there. In, this is the data from NHS, from UK, from 2018, and basically MRIs, there are just 3 million MRIs done per year. And you can imagine those are not done only on Philips system, they are done on multiple other types of systems. So there's not so much data, so you should be also careful when you interpret this data, how much can you actually generalize having such a, not quite a lot of data. Another thing is that basically we look into machine data. And Machine data, one of the problems of it is that it's not really regulated in OEMs. Uh, most of the times uh, was, is meant for debugging, is meant for the, when the machine uh, was broke down, the field service engineer goes there, tries to fix it, and then he uses the uh, log file, and then he tries to read it. So actually most of this machine data is human readable, but that you can imagine is basically like a document, so do Automatization on such a document is basically impossible or very difficult. <laughs> and and, and another thing is that the knowledge about the data structure of different type of events comes from, these machines are very complex, there are so many departments, so many people involved in building this system, so, and every department puts its own entry in this log file. So, the knowledge is distributed, and almost for each type of log, even log, you have to define your own parsing. So, again, very fun. And the last one that is very specific for process mining, and as I said, this we encounter in other companies too, so this is not specific for MRI only, the timestamps. Uh, what do they actually mean? Is it execution time, or is it logging time? 
And then you di discover that for some departments, they put execution time, for some other department is logging time. And then they also say uh, granularity, minutes is enough for the field service engineer. But <sighs> when you try to actually look to it and you like from a process point of view to understand how the system is used, then you have a problem. So I guess at this moment you will ask, okay, so if there's so much problems with this data, why you would want to use it? Because it's basically data quality from the start. Let's not talk about it. <laughs> so why you want to use it is because, yeah, even if you know which data you want, and in this case we actually knew which data we want, uh, if you create requirements, it, it will take basically... Uh, how it was, in terms of money, it was around 1,000 euro per system to be updated with the new, uh, if you have a new update. And furthermore, uh, of course, uh, if you make a new update, you have to go to all the FDA process in order to be sure that your system is still conform, even if, uh, you, if you just want to update the logging part. And then you have to contact all the hospitals that are all around the world and they have to accept to do the update for you. So if you are in a happy, happy world, you have the, we, we estimate it uh, back of the envelope, it will be six months till you have some data or and actually years till you have enough data to do. So basically what you do, you look to the data you have and you try to cope with it. And of course, in the process, what we did, we took requirements and we are continuously improving the pipeline and giving requirements to the engineers and so on. But basically, I will, and now I have two concrete examples of to, So we said we looked to the parameters. And the first parameters, so on the one side is basically how the parameters look on the user interface. In the other side is more or less how they look in the machine data. It's not really how they look because we are not allowed to show you exactly the log file. So this is an abstraction a bit. But TE, echo time, the software engineers, they decided to, look, to log the echo time that appears only one entry in the UI through, I think there are five or six parameters because they, want, they log it into context. So if it's used for in combination with FFE, it will be FFE underscore T. If it's used in combination with AC, it's AC underscore T. So basically, but that's already a happy because it's a set, so you can basically immediately retrieve the echo time. But then we have the, the field of view. So field of view is basically the box that you want to see the, the picture, which part of the body you want to see. The application specialist basically will, ex, will look, RL means right to left, FH it's a fit head, and AP anterior posterior. So basically, the specialist will just look to the person and says, okay, this is what I want to see in the picture. What we see in the log file, it's the MPS, and this is basically how the system sees the patient. And basically, nobody bothered to log the originals. You just find those. And those, basically, uh, you can imagine, depend on the orientation of the patient. And many other parameters, but let's not go into details. So basically, going back from that part to the other part, it's quite a complex algorithm. But for operational profile, what basically Mark team wants, he says, we want to create automated tests. And this automated test will fill in the user parameters will not fill in what is in the log file. So we had to do basically, so the first step, one of the first steps we had to do, we had to do basically reverse engineer the user parameters from the log file. Uh, the second part was also, okay, now we do this, but still we have around 100, of para 100 parameters per scan. And we have, and moreover, a lot of these parameters, they are not what we find so in, in, um, in the up part. Uh, okay, there's not. In the up part, you see an extract from uh, ACR guidelines that's basically a medical document that describes how to do MRI. And the, terms, the user parameters, you don't really see it as the same as in the, um, you see new uh, things like T1, T2 that you don't see it there. And then, we also had, we are looking also how the, the, the scan names are put by the specialist. So we had hundreds of parameters, so we said, okay, we cannot do this with um, 
if we put hundreds of parameters as an activity name in a process mining, what, this will not look nice. So basically what we did, we used this and we made a selection. So this is basically the workflow, the idea. We took the scan software parameters. We use uh, the knowledge. Actually, there should be software engineers also involved because we needed them to know they were writing the log file. And we basically created new application parameters. And what we did, we did a filtering <laughs> such that we reconstruct basically the scan names. And how we implemented this? So one of the good things, and actually it was very nice, uh, because MR already put the log file in a database, uh, because otherwise we had to do basically parsing of all the text files. So luckily we didn't need to go that bad, so we had already the software, the software parameters in the database. We uh, basic, and then, we use Xtext, it's a domain-specific language technology, so it's a language that allows you quite quickly to create a new language. And then, for example, application specialists, they can say, okay, these parameters, I want to actually see them in this way. So basically, they can encode their language in terms of the parameters. And what is also nice for uh, this, uh, the Xtext is they can generate automatic code. And this code, uh, we uh, generated Python code. And basically, this is the pipeline. And this is uh, the outcome, where ba uh, basically the tag names are what came out of the algorithm. And those are the scan names, as they were written by per people. And what you see there is basically they are very close. And the next step, basically, was indeed going to uh, the, uh, going to building the operational profile where we will we use uh, Disco, and there uh, uh, Mark will show a, a demo. A demo I mean. We still have eight and a half minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I thought it was open. The D, the D. This yeah. one, yes, there it is. So let's, oh, let's open quickly one of the files that we have. And I already made a selection only to look at, um, at one of the anatomies, and that was the spine anatomy. And what you see over here, um, I have here some um, case IDs, quite, some, quite, some, uh, quite a lot. Uh, and over here, I have already um, some activities in there. And I actually have three activities in here, and that's, those are the activities that Carmen just showed uh, from the translation from the technical terminology into the, uh, into the user terminology, basically. And what you see over here, especially, for example, in the second line, is so something that you also saw in, um, in, the, pre in the presentation, is that uh, a scan is called a T2, TSE, and in this case is an orientation in the sagittal plane. So that's a certain orientation. And then over here, of course, like always, we have the timings, the timestamps, the, the start time, and the end time. So I just import it quickly. Let's see. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and as you can see, as you can already see a little bit, uh, this is only showing like, uh, well, 43% of, uh, of all the activities. So let's imagine that I just uh, also take around 50% of, uh, of all the paths as well. It will take a little while. But just for illustration purposes, you will see that uh, you will create, yeah, already that we downscaled all of the parameters, the amount of parameters that we are using. Um, but you can already see that there are still a lot of paths and a lot of activities uh, available, and we will actually create a spaghetti-like uh, structure. Um, yeah, I, already, I think we already saw in the, some other presentations that it was already towards like the spaghetti-like structure, so let me not uh, show that uh, right now due to, for time reasons. Uh, but for us, what was, all, what was really interesting to see is, for example, when you yeah, just go to like a small percentage of activities and small percentage of paths, uh, you can already see quite some quite nice uh, outcomes. And well, personally, I also have an uh, applications background. So before I was in the system in the verification group, I was an application specialist. Um, and when I see, for example, for spine anatomy. Um, 
scans uh, being executed in the following order, uh, like this. Like this one is the, like this one as the first one, the T1 weighted FFV, well, FFV mix in this case, it's called. Uh, and then a T2 TSE sag sagittal, and then followed by a T1 TSE sagittal, and final finally by a T2 TSE in the transversal plane. I already know. Okay, hey, this is uh, this is something familiar. This is uh, this is actually something that I would expect. Um, and this actually gives us really nice and quick insights about what is really um, what our customers are really doing. And from an operational profile perspective, yeah, we would like to know what the general customers are really doing. And so, yeah, because this is only like the 1%, and I assume that this then is also one of the um, one of the highest occurring variants. So if I go over here, yeah, you already see that it is over here as well. The same, the, this is the first uh, variant that is occurring, and you already see that it is actually the same uh, as the only the one percent that we just uh, just showed over here, showed in the in the in the map. Um, yeah. So I saw some people also uh, looking at some of that in some of the talks. People were also looking really into performances. Um, yeah, and from our perspective, from from an operational profile uh, perspective, we are not really interested in the performance, but we, because we really want to know in what order are our sequences, are our scans really performed. Maybe late, um, um, maybe later on, if we want to de want to de derive secondary metrics, uh, if we want to look at it, then it will become interesting. Um, but I actually have looked at it uh, before. And it's uh, it's really nice to see. Well, uh, if you look, for example, at the mean durations, you already see that there are quite some, um, yeah, uh, quite some outliers there. Um, and um, one of the I've uh, actually deep dived into it once, uh, and I saw, for example, that there are in our log files there are scans that don't get an, really an end state. Um, can have various reasons. Um, yeah, and uh, actually, if you if you look at that, and you, you can, then you are also able to exclude those scans, of course. Um, but for our purposes, at this moment in time, that is not really uh, really of big interest, I have to say. Um, so I think that's that's where I will leave it for this uh, small demo for now, uh, because we also we still have three minutes. <laughs> And we also have some conclusions, which I would like to share with you, to just to wrap up, uh, wrap up our presentation. Yes, there it goes. Carmen, do you still have to? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So just to wrap up, um, basically, um, what Carmen just said is that. Um, one of the one of our takeaways is that uh, the data and the application uh, should speak the same language. So basically, we saw that the technical uh, implementation and technical terminology in the in our logging is different from the language that the customer is really speaking. And uh, since we are interested in operational profiles and therefore also interested in the language that our customer is really speaking, we should speak the same language. So basically, there should be a translation, uh, and that's what we try to do already. But of course, there is still a big challenge ahead. Um, then uh, use the right data techniques, and of course, process mining really helps uh, helps us uh, in doing so. And also, of course, use the right tools, and there is of course Disco really helpful because Disco gives us quick and uh, yeah, quick uh, and good insights in what are the generic ways of working from our customers and yeah and we are really interested in seeing that and uh, yeah of course our end goal is again to have that implemented for our automated test cases um, and last but not least con constantly improve the pipeline and i think i've heard that already several times uh, in the, in the talks uh, this morning and also this afternoon um, is that it's really important to yeah to take your learnings from uh, from what you implemented before to take your learnings and then uh, yeah update your pipeline with those learnings and I think that's uh, that's something that's not uh, uh, not quickly finished so yeah 
I think we will have still some work uh, to do there. And I think with that, I would like to conclude this, uh, this presentation. And if, if there are any questions, uh, feel free to ask them. Thank you very much. I'll start off again. Please raise your hand if you have questions for Mark and Carmen. So um, you, you outlined in the beginning and also just now like the operational profiles that can be used for different things, right? So the um, adding additional test cases to improve the reliability uh, further of the machines is, is one of the main things where they're going to be used. So these mm -hmm. sequences of the actual usage. Yeah. Um, what is, in your opinion, the, um, yeah, the, the next opportunity or the most interesting one, um, what you could do with those operational profiles, apart from the testing uh, side? Um, yeah, one of the things is that uh, in, uh, in MRI we have a certain uh, preset of protocols that is delivered, of preset of uh, examinations that is delivered to our customers. Um, and that was actually what you saw in, in, uh, in, the, uh, in the applications uh, team, is they, they, make those, uh, they, mo they make those examinations, and, but they are based on knowledge from the field, uh, and they, yeah, yeah, they are basically based on, uh, on the domain knowledge. Uh, with this data, we can actually check and validate if these uh, examinations are well, according to standards and according to what the customers are really doing, and maybe we can well either help the customers making uh, making better uh, examinations, or uh, update also our uh, preset uh, database that our customers can actually use uh, out of the box uh, from uh, with each delivery. Yeah, great. Okay, thank you. Who has a question? What do you mean to have enough data? What was for your, what is the meaning for your having enough, ma uh, enough data? What was enough for you? Yeah, it's difficult to say what's enough, but uh, for example, uh, if you uh, think about the good machine learning algorithms, usually you need million and million of entries to, to afterwards really l say, okay, this is a good model and I can reuse it. Where here basically, yeah, we, we be, you get insights, but you cannot say, hey, I'm actually, what I get out of it, it's valid everywhere and it's valid. I, I cannot automate afterwards. So it was more based on the feeling or it was more representative sampling? Or it was more done first, the statistical analysis to say, okay, this is enough sampling, this sampling is really representative and that's why you decided to have so much uh, data or it was more really based on the business context. Can That's you repeat right. the question? Uh, I, I didn't understand okay. completely the, 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 uh, the, the, yeah, the, the actual question. Um, sorry, this was a really technical question. Uh, don't worry. It was more, it's like, um, you can uh, say how big is the data based on the statistical method, or it was more based on the business decision that was to say, okay, that will be enough. Or it is basically the data you have. So you, okay. you, you, it is it, you. So we had access actually to all the data that Philips uh, MRI uh, collects. So we don't had restrictions there. Uh, but at the same time, there is. A, I think in Philips is two years retention retention policy. Uh, yeah. It's so two, basically, two that's years, also yeah. what the company does. Basically, continuous uh, continuous purge data. So you don't have do uh, you don't have uh, a lot of data. But the idea is that yeah. Uh, you have to ask yourself, how much can I learn? When what can I learn actually when the data is so diverse? Um, and I can, I can actually, so, uh, some insight, it's also that when we started the project, so this was a, uh, it started out with a European project. It was a European project started four years ago where um, um, Philip Semar said, yeah, we want to understand more what our customers are doing. And uh, the first thing that they ask us is actually to cluster the scans. And I can tell you that was basically a failed attempt. We, I didn't do it personally. We took actually the uh, uh, data scientists. And basically, they couldn't, because it's, uh, you have too, too much 
variance and too much sparse data, and also the type of data you have from categorical to numerical and so on. Uh, I also data governance doesn't exist, so data basically machine data just changing uh, changes. So that's also what you ask. I'm looking to this data now, and I'm looking to data from three months ago. Can I actually this uh, the I, they have the same name? Do they still have the same meaning? And so on, so on. So yeah. <laughs> Exactly. One more question, and then we have another coffee break. No more questions at this point? Okay, so then let's thank Mark and Carmen again. And